All right, so we're in this series on the book of 1 John, and uh, we are going through sort of chapter by chapter the lessons that John is teaching, and sort of the main theme of this letter was to identify what's real. And we live in a culture right now where it is no longer... Do you remember when it used to be like if you had photographic proof or if you had like video evidence, that was a slam dunk, right? Like that was obvious. We need to turn the lights up in the house. Um, I need to be able to stare into people's souls as I speak. And I can't do that. Where's your soul, Alec? There you go. Um, now, with the deep fake stuff and, and the stuff we can do that looks completely natural, no longer are photos or videos valid evidence, right? We know that with VR, man, VR, I talked about that the first week. That stuff is so trippy. You can totally, your mind, even though your body knows it's still standing in the room, your mind can feel like it's in a completely different place. And so the church was going through something similar. The church has been a few decades. It's getting established. And John sees that there is a heart, there is a spirit in the church, which is one of arrogance, one that says we are now at a higher level. We believe in Jesus Christ. We've seen the work of his Holy Spirit in our lives. In fact, we've attained such a great level, we don't even need to really love our neighbors anymore um, because we are on a heavenly plane and they are not. This is an agnostic type belief. Another part of that was that Jesus uh, was not actually fully God and fully man. He was a man who God's spirit came upon at baptism, left at the cross because there's no way the spirit of God can endure such horrible thing as the cross and then came back to the resurrected Jesus. So all sorts of things are like that going on and they're preaching these things. And so John writes this letter to sort of set the record straight and say, knock it off. Here's what's real. Here's reality. And here's what is false. And so I had planned on being in John chapter 4 this morning, right? One of the greatest verses in, in this whole section is to test the spirits. Test those who are teaching you. Test them against the scripture. What has God already said is what they, is what they are saying, what Jesus spoke. And I love that. And so I even told the pastors on Tuesday, this is what I'm going to be preaching on. And then Tuesday afternoon, I open up my Bible and begin to read, because I, I read and reread before I do it, and I'm reading, and I'm reading 1 John 3, 1, not 1 John 4, 1. And I didn't catch it, and I start reading, and I'm like, wait a minute. I thought they talked about testing the spirits right out the gate. Where is that? And then I realize I'm in chapter 3, not chapter 4, but by then the damage had been done. The Lord had clearly said, you need to talk about this. And because last week we talked on 1 John 3, 11 through the end of 11, I hadn't talked about 1 through 10, but specifically this morning where he stopped me was 1 through 3. Because this is the rationale. I don't want you to teach about testing the spirits in life until people understand my, their identity in me. And John clearly lets you know what it is in these three verses here. So we're going to look at that this morning, and uh, I hope this brings a solid foundation for some of you in here this morning. For others, I hope it's a, it's a needed reminder, right? We do not overcome the world by our knowledge or by our power, our finances or our status, but by the blood of Christ. And sometimes, even if you've been following the Lord for decades, you can forget that. So let us remember that this morning. First John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 goes like this. How great is the love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. You see the exclamation point at the end of that? Does, does it have it up there? Yeah. That is what we are. John is like driving this point home. You are a child of God. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of of God. When? Now. now. Right now. We are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. For she, we shall see Him as He is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. All right. Why did the Lord let me move from four to this? 
I want to show you this this morning because I believe that understanding this, I mean, not just understanding it as far as like I understand that a chair is for sitting in, understanding it, letting it burst the boundaries of what you believe, letting it overtake your emotions, your mind, your will. Do you understand what it means to have access to God? Really, access to God. I said last week, I've been in the Old Testament a lot, right? And judges and the kings and first, second Samuel. And one of the things we first see King Saul error in is Samuel doesn't show up in time in this battle with the Philistines coming. And so he's like, you know what? I'm just going to make the offerings. I'll go before God. And there's a heavy rebuke from the prophet Samuel. He says, that's not how it's done. It's, it's my job. That's what I have been ordained for. That's, what did you do? Why did you do this? We don't live in that time anymore. Thank God, right? We live in a time, at the end of this, we're going to take communion where we're going to observe the body and the blood of Christ where I have access to God. I don't need a priest to go before him on my behalf. I don't even need to call a pastor or a friend who I know is a, you know, maybe a stronger believer, if, right? And I'm ear quotes. A stronger believer and have them go to the Lord for me. You have access to God. And this is what John is wanting to show them. Stop it. Knock it off. He's saying, this is who you are. How great the love the Father has lavished upon us. We're going to get into what that means to be lavished upon. So right now, by faith, it's possible to behold God. It's possible to sense his presence. In verse two, it talks about the great experience of of beholding God. He says something which even goes beyond that. He says, dear friends, which is really, again, that's sort of a weak English thing, right? Like, hey, dear friends, what he's actually saying is uh, the word is agapetos or akapados. I don't know how to speak Greek. But he says, my beloved, my dearly loved ones, now we are children of God and what will be has not yet been made known, but, when we, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. Now, John moves from what we are now, children of God, to the future pretty quickly. He says there is a time coming where we don't know what it will be like, but we will see him face to face. Let's not overlook that fact, though, that right now you are a child of God. One of the things Keller says is Christianity is like a diamond. There are thousands of facets to it, depending on the perspective that you are looking at the diamond, and yet there's still just one reality. It's one diamond, right? But how you look at it can change how you see it. And here's one more way to look at it. Beloved, we are children of God now. How often have you said or heard other Christians say, I'm really trying to be a good Christian? I'm trying to be a Christian. Oh yeah, I know about God and Jesus. I've looked into it. I'm considering it. Or I gave my life to God at a summer camp when I was a kid, and now I'm just trying to be a Christian. In the words of the wise prophet, Yoda, (laughs) there is do or do not. There is no try. You see, with Jesus Christ, it is not and mess a fact of, okay, I accepted Jesus at church and now I'm in the process of becoming his son or daughter. Nope. You become his son or daughter. Now, in that moment, all rights as a son or daughter are granted to you and all access is granted to you right there. That's powerful, right? But how many of us live in that? How many of us actively say, yes, I am his child I have access to him. I have that right. See, the enemy wants us to live in shame. The deceiver, that's what Satan is, the de- it's deceiver. He wants us to live, oh, my voice got very ominous. He wants us to live in this identity that says, I can't go to God, I can't go to church, I can't go where all those righteous people are. Are there any righteous people in here this morning? Righteous by the blood of God? Are there any self-righteous people in here this morning? (laughs) Got a few self-righteous. Good. I'm glad I appreciate the honesty. That's what we think, though. I can't go to church. I can't go to the house of God. I need to get my affairs in order. I haven't been a good Christian. I need to try to be better. 
There is do or do not. There is no try. In fact, as a father of four kids, a son and three daughters, I can tell you that when my children are behaving well, I feel less like a father than when they are being disobedient. Right? When everything's going smooth and they're sharing and they're saying kind words to each other and it's just like everything is great for like three minutes out of a week, like nothing there. It's like I'm not even doing anything. They, they're just running life on their own. No, when do you feel most like a parent, parent? When you have to parent them. When they're being bad, disobedient, disrespectful, all of those things that it's our job as a parent to then come alongside them. And it's hard work. That's when you feel like a parent. So why do we take our relationship with God and put it into this facet that says, oh, I can't go before the Almighty. I'm filthy and I'm dirty and I've been disobedient. Isn't that exactly when you want your kids to come to you? If your kid does something wrong, you want them to hide it until they've got their life together and then come and share it with you? You want them to come to you immediately. The sooner they come to you, the sooner you in your wisdom can help them overcome whatever they're going through. So I ask again, why, when it comes to God, do we have this mindset that I messed up Saturday night, I can't go to church this Sunday, I'll let some time pass? It's a lie. It's a lie because we do not allow that first verse to be lavished by the love of God to break into our emotions, our mind, our will, and change us. I don't care what you say, there are so many Christians who still receive Christ because it is fire insurance from what the alternative might be. And they never go deeper into that relationship that Jesus is inviting us into. I'll show you here in a bit, verse after verse of him inviting us in to this relationship. And here's the thing about this. It says it's bestowed upon us. That means a gift. It's presented to us. It's a present. What do you have to do with the present? You have to receive it. It doesn't matter if it's given to you, you have to receive it. And so if you don't receive it, it just sits there, right? It could be very valuable. But if you do not receive it, it sits there. Imagine being in a position where you are given something that could save you. Save you from whatever you're going through. And it's gifted to you. And you're like, oh, that's a very nice gift. I think it's wonderful for you to have it. But I'm not worthy of it, or I don't believe in its ability to save me. I'm just going to leave it right there. Because here's a common notion amongst people who look at the God and look at Jesus and the exclusivity of Jesus, and they say, here's the thing. Didn't God create everyone? Well, then aren't all people God's children? Are you trying to tell me that only Christians are God's children? You see, I'm a more loving in person, and I believe all people are God's children. Okay, well, let's look at this then. In the fact that God created everyone, and he is the creator of all things, yes, all people are part of his creation, and he loves all of his creation, right? We can agree on that. And so if we're going to look at it in that facet, and we're looking at it in a very material base facet, God loves all people and all his creation. But God in his love, gave the gift of freedom from sin and death to his children. And all they had to do was pick it up and take it. But tens and hundreds of millions have said, no thanks. No thank you. You see, I know with that gift comes submission. I know with that gift, I have to acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I know with that gift means that I have to give up my own personal wants and desires to love others and to love a God more than myself. No, thank you. I don't need that. I'm trying to fill my soul with something and I don't think that's going to do it. I'm pretty sure it's money or sex or fame or relationships or work. I'm going to give those a try. I think those have worked out for other people. So when you say that God is the father of all people in the sense he is their creator, yes, but in the sense that he is their father in relationship as son or daughter, no, not at all. In fact, it would be 
ridiculous. It would be a complete misunderstanding of what the gift is to say, oh, well, all people have it. All people have it. All people have access to it, but not all people have it. So does he love his creation? Absolutely. John 1.12 says, For as many as received him, as believed in his name, he gave rights to become children of God. You have to receive it. This is why it's a lie, it's, it's blasphemy, it's ignorance to say, what an unloving God, only Christians go to heaven. No, anybody who wishes to accept it goes to heaven. Because we're a people that need to label things in order to understand them, we call us Christians. Jesus just said it, we were essentially followers of the way. That was what it was originally. And people were like, what's the way? Well, it's Christ. Oh, so you're Christian. Sure. Like, we're followers of Jesus. We put labels on things, not Christ. Christ said, here I am. Here is the gift of salvation. You can receive it. So since I was created by God and God loves people, I believe that what it means to be a child of God should be something that is important and should be actively played out in my life. So what does it mean to have rights? Am I sounding weird again? Is it just me? What does it mean to have rights? In the time of the New Testament, if you were somebody who had a large estate, lots of money and things to give to people, and yet you had no children as heirs to all your stuff, you could go and find an adult who is somebody who you knew, loved, is a friend of the family, whatever, and you could adopt them, even if they were an adult. And actually, a lot of times was an adult. And then that person, once you adopted them, had all the rights as your children. 100% the day you adopted them, they had rights. They were now heirs to your estate. They could make decisions, all of that. If you had any debts coming into the relationship, that fought your father would have paid them off. He would not have brought you in, kept your debts, and expected you to pay them off. Part of adoption was he paid off all of your debts. Isn't that interesting? We, we think of adoption, and it's always for children, or, or especially young children, we think, oh, that, that's adoption. But this was adoption in the time of Christ. Here's something else that happens when you're adopted. I alluded to it earlier. You get access to that person that other people don't have. Right? You get access to that person. So arguably, the President of the United States is, has been, for many decades, the most powerful position in, in the world as we know it. Right? The most powerful position. This man, tons of responsibility. Who's the one person, if you think about it, and I, so let's just look at it in my perspective. If I'm president, I've got three girls and a boy. If my daughters cry out to me in the middle of the night that they are sick or scared or they need a drink, do I get up? No, Christy does, because I won't wake up and hear it. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, do I get up if for some reason I do hear them? Yes. If Christy wakes up in the middle of the night and says, I need a drink, I say, well, then go get a drink. <laughs> Your legs work. <laughs> but if my little girl does it, if my child does it, I'm up. Like, I'm up right away. Let's go. What do we need? That child has access, right, that nobody else in the world has access to. Think about that for a minute. And I use the president's position to show the responsibility, the, the overwhelming amount of control and authority. You have access to God Almighty. You get that? This is why I, I wanted to go over this. Like, I think so many times as Christians, we look at him as Bruce Almighty said, an angry kid with a magnifying glass, and I'm just an ant, and he's waiting to burn me up if I mess up. It's so far from that, friends. It's so far from that. He is that father that in the middle of the night, you can cry out to him and say, I'm thirsty or my legs hurt, and he will get up and come to you because you have that access. And this isn't just for those born of Jewish blood. Jesus said it would be for all men, all mankind. Talk about exclusivity, inclusivity. It's the most inclusive call to love that exists amongst the gods. 
The gods are mean. Do you know that? If you look at Norse mythology, Greek mythology, the gods are not people anybody wants anything to do with. We please them and we hope they do not bring retribution upon us. Jesus Christ is not that. He came and said, I wish for a deeper relationship. So I will pay the cost and I will present the gift of righteousness to you. All you have to do is receive it. That's the gospel, friends. It's not complicated. It doesn't require 700 laws. It doesn't require 10. According to Jesus, it's just two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. One more thing. When Jesus Christ prayed to the Father for us, he said, Father, I want them to have the same love you gave me. I want you to love them even as you love me. So what he's saying is I want you to love the adopted, my brothers and sisters, like you love me. As a father of biological children and adopted children, I can tell you that our goal as parents is to love our children who are adopted equally as we love those who are biological. And we're not perfect at it because we're flawed humans. But what God said was, I will be. I will love you as I love my son. And this was the heart of Jesus. They are not second class citizens. They are not less than. I want you to love them as you have loved me. The minute you receive Christ and believe on his name, it says you get rights. So what are those rights? To be loved as he loves his natural son? Absolutely. The one who marched into hell for you. The one upon whom all things were built for. Everything. You have those same rights as a son or daughter. Doesn't it make sense then that the deceiver would attack this identity? Because we know a kid that is safe and secure in their father, who knows their father will answer their cry in the middle of the night or in the middle of the workday. They, they have boldness, don't they? They're bold. One kid may say, oh no, you can't go into my dad, he's working. Another kid walks, <laughs> my kids <laughs> walk right into my office. Even when there's people in there, we gotta work on that. <laughs> There's boldness. I can go into dad's office anytime because I have access to him. What if you treated your relationship with God like that? And rather than look at yourself when you've made a mistake and say, oh, I'm unworthy, or rather than look at somebody and and we judge, oh, they've fallen away from Christ. They must not be Christ's anymore. Okay, well, that doesn't jive with the Bible because the Bible says that we have legal position. It's a contract. It's a covenant. It's an obligation and a promise by God. So if you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and then proceed to spend the next 10 years in the slop and the sewage of life, does that mean you are not a Christian? Well, did he really receive Christ or was it just a fake thing? I don't know. Who are you to determine that? All I know is that Christ said, you call upon me and receive the gift and it's yours now, instantly. You don't need to prove yourself. You don't need to change a bunch of things. You're mine. Trust me. Come to me. Let me change you. If you have a child that you raise up, right? Or maybe one that you adopt and they come into your family, they agree, yes. And then a year goes by and they rebel. And you've loved them and their home is your home. Are they no longer your child because they rebelled? Even though they were adopted? No, of course not. They're your child. No matter what. They can come home disgusting, broken, bloody. And you will love them and get them picked up and put back on their feet. You know how many parents I know have done this? Maybe you, a parent did this with you where they picked you up, put you back on your feet, and you are where you are now because somebody loved you when you were at your worst. This is how God loves you. This is why we can't give up on people who we believe are too far for God to reach. This is why we can't make preconceived judgments about people and then say, ah, no, they're not his. Let God make that decision. 
I have one job, not to tell whether or not they're his, but to love them. And loving them is sometimes rebuking what they're doing, but letting them know my home is open for you when you need help. I don't agree with what you're doing. What you're doing is against the heart and the will of God, but I love you deeply. And I will be there for you. That is a Christian response. Not telling each other, oh, well, they're not saved anyway, so it doesn't matter. All right. Next, we get into this section where he says, but there is something to come. There is something that is even greater that is going to come when we will see him face to face. Romans 8 tells us that nature is subject to decay. We know this, right? Flowers rise up and they're beautiful for a short season. And then what? June and July in Arizona come and they just die. We have this amazing flower in our backyard, cow lilies. I think I'm saying that right. I don't know if it's cow lilies or calla lilies. It's not important. Thank you. But it completely goes away and there's nothing there in this section of rocks that is just rocks. And then every spring it shoots up in like two weeks, this big vibrant green plant and then these beautiful white flowers. And then somewhere around late May, June, it just dies like in three days. I mean, brown over and then disintegrates with the monsoon winds. And it's like it was never there. We know that nature tends towards decay, right? How cool that when we come and we see the Lord face to face, that when we experience the full transformation into the glory that is offered to us through Christ, that we bring nature with us. Nature is redeemed alongside us. The rocks cry out to him. Nature is part of the fall and nature will be redeemed when we are fully redeemed. First Corinthians 13 says, we see things as though through a dark mirror dimly, but soon it will be face to face. John 17, 24, Jesus is praying and he says, Father, I will that they may also be with me where I am and they may behold my glory you gave me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Psalm 17, 15, when I awake, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I shall experience total fulfillment when I see your form. And this is what we're going to close on. Total fulfillment. See, what John is explaining there in verse 3 of what I read is a condition greater than where we are now because in that condition, our hearts will be completely fulfilled in Him. To be face-to-face with Him, to be purified as He is pure is what we are seeking after. We seek after it in life through all sorts of things. Intellect, beauty and aesthetics, Sexual appetite, relations, creativity, what we make, what we build. Don't we? We're seeking after this fulfillment in us through all of these things. Who loves sitting in, in, in maybe you're an ocean person and you just love to sit and watch the waves break. Who loves that? Okay. Who loves sitting and watching the sun rise or go down over a mountaintop with pine trees? Yeah, that's me. I put both hands up on that one. And you could do it over and over again, huh? Not one sunset, not one wave crashing fulfills you. You could do all day, and then what do you do? You go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, you carry your chair down to the beach, you set it up, and you do it again all day. You just watch those waves break. And as wonderful as it is, it is not fulfilling you. In fact, John Flavel, a Puritan uh, priest, a Puritan Puritan writer in the 1600s says this when he's talking about 1 John 3, all that delights you in earthly things can never satisfy you for all of your desires are in God. The comforts you have here only drop or only drops that inflame, not satisfy the appetite of your soul, but the lamb will lead you to fountains of living water. Isn't that fascinating? What if I could look at the things that I'm constantly striving after to fill that, whatever that is in me, that I know I'm only going to need it again and again and again. And I begin to say, Lord, 
as close as I can be to you here on earth, would you lead me in that? Open my understanding of what it means to be your child. When the enemy lies to me and says I don't have access to you, when he says I'm not worthy to come before you, when my past comes up and tells me, reminds me of what a failure I've been and the mistakes that I've made and the people I've hurt, Dad, would you reach down and would you pull me out of that pit? Because it's a pit, isn't it? And we can get trapped in it looking up like there's no way out. And say, Dad, pull me out. I'm sick of being stuck in this place, this lie that says, I can't come to you, I don't have access to you. I will behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied in seeing your form. Christ is the ultimate thing that we are after as Christians. All of the New Testament, Testament is rustling with this idea that as Christians, to find our satisfaction in being sons and daughters of God. That if you find you're satisfied in that, you can enjoy all the things of the world. You can enjoy beautiful things, relationships, work, intellect, but you don't have to worry about finding your identity or satisfaction in them because you are satisfied in Christ. Isn't that great? This means that a Christian should not be upset and to a point of devastation about a broken relationship or a loss. Because as difficult as that broken relationship is, and we're allowed to mourn it, of course, we're human, but it should not devastate you because you're satisfied in Christ, not that relationship. The loss of a job, the loss of a limb, huh? Should not devastate us. I'm talking about my buddy right here. It should not devastate us because our identity is not in those things. We can mourn them, but my satisfaction, my desires are based in God. Oh, this is life-giving. This is life-giving. As we close and prepare our hearts for communion here, I want you to picture something. And I say this because I lived with this growing up in church, in the Baptist church, in the Lutheran church, was this overwhelming sense of guilt for my sin. And I talk about the wrongs on Friday and Saturday night and not wanting to go on church on Sunday, not because I've heard stories, but because I lived through that in my teen years of, I have so disappointed God. I can't bear to face him right now. You see, at that age, I didn't understand the access I had to him. I still didn't understand what it meant to be his son or daughter. For those of you who have kids, God's given you the most blessed example in the entire world of how he loves you. You see, if your child comes to you after tripping and falling in the mud and cutting their foot, so there is blood and mud all over them, and they walk up to you on Sunday morning, and I'm wearing this delightful shirt that I'm wearing, and they say, Dad, pick me up. I'm hurt. Do I tell them to clean themselves up first? <laughs> well, well, wash yourself and then I'll pick you up and I'll comfort you. Don't you see the shirt that I'm wearing? <laughs> I can't look bad in front of other people. Your, your mess is going to get all over me. <laughs> your mess is going to get all over me. What do you do, mom and dad? You pick them up. You don't care. Because you understand that their mess cannot affect you. It is temporary. It is you are greater than the mud or the blood they may bring upon you. You see, Christ brings us to himself. He says, come to me wherever you're at in whatever way that you are, and I will lavish my love upon you. You see, there's not, none of your sin can stain me. I overcame the grave. I already took all of that sin upon me and then destroyed it. So whatever you think makes you unworthy to come to me, it's a lie. Come to me. You have that access. But you have that access if you've received the gift of Christ. If you haven't, then these are just words. And so that's my invitation for you. If you haven't received Christ, I invite you 
today to come and talk with one of our prayer partners or our pastors and say, I want to be able to have that kind of access to God. I've been filling my life with all the other different forms of appetite. I need, I need Jesus. And then we've got these cards here through our Freedom in Christ ministry, which are incredible. One is who I am in Christ. I'm accepted. I'm secure. I'm significant. It's got all of the verses behind it. And then the orange one here has all of that as well, but then talks about breaking free of addiction on the back, which would be great if that's something you're going through or know somebody who's going through. It's great as a bookmark, keep in your car, keep somewhere you'll see, and it's just quick access to those verses and what they say. These will be up here. I know Ryan, who leads our freedom ministry, will be in the back with some of them, but you can grab these as well. I'll set them up here. Let's pray and come before the Lord in communion. Father, oh, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. I thank you, God, that my identity is not found in my nice blue shirt. It is not found in the things that I have. It is not found in the things that I've made. Lord, a long time ago, you found me and made my identity in you. And you have upheld that in me now for 34 years. I am beyond grateful and humbled and blessed. I pray that those here listening today, God, would do the same. That they would cry out to you in their brokenness. That they would rest in your arms. That they would understand the access that you have given us through Jesus. And they would take hold of it. Through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord, lead men and women in this room to move towards you as sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have the bread and the cup, we're going to take communion together. So I went up to North Phoenix where my brother lives and spent Friday night there and all of Saturday with them and his family. And my brother loves the Lord deeply. And typically whenever he talks about the love of Christ, tears will come into his eyes. He just can't help it. And we were talking, we were talking about the disgusting things going on in the world and the crimes against children and uh, the sex trade and slavery and all of that that's going on. And one of the things he said really struck me. He said, you know, as disgusting and horrendous and terrible that all of that is, there is nothing more horrendous in the history of mankind than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he said, I wish more Christians understood that. You see, when you look at Jesus Christ, one who came down, God, the creator, in, in the form of his creation with one purpose, to love, to set free, and to restore, to give life, to all who would have received it. And what did we do? We beat him, we spit upon him, we scoffed him, we whipped him, and then we stripped him naked and hung him on a cross to die the most painful death we as humans could have imagined up. We took the very gift of life and spat upon it. When I take communion, I remember not just that Christ died for my sin, that that night that he broke bread with the disciples, but I remember that it is my filthiness, my bloody, muddy body that he receives to himself and that he purifies. And you see, when you come to Christ, he doesn't set you back down <laughs> a mess. He purifies you. He begins to clean, restore, and redeem. And so as he took bread with his disciples that night, he said, this is my body. A body that we would abuse, torture, and kill. And he says, it's okay. I give it to you. Father, I thank you for not withholding the Son. I thank you, Lord, that you sought relationship when we were your enemy and against you. I thank you for the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, let's eat together. And then it was by his blood, by his stripes, it says that we are healed. Because Jesus took the cup 
after they had eaten and he said this is my blood it is the blood of a new covenant between God and man the old covenants will have passed away they are no longer valid under this my blood is the covenant and it satisfies the justification of an almighty God towards his creation it is my gift all you have to do is receive it says he blessed it so father we bless this now we thank you for the blood of your son Jesus that he did rise again and a mighty war like a lion overcame death and passes that gift on to us it is with great humility and gratitude we drink this this morning in Jesus name amen